everybody. I'm John Sozek, Director of the Arts and Humanities Collaborative here at Albertus Magnus College in New Haven, Connecticut. This is the first episode of our new podcast, Studium, an Arts and Humanities podcast. I'll be talking with Matt Wagner, a professor of philosophy at the college. We'll talk about why the podcast is called Studium, what we hope to accomplish in this project of the podcast, and I'll talk a little bit about my own background. We'll also talk about an article that I recently published called Scattering the Stars, Personalist Pedagogy and Catholic Higher Education. We'll trace some of the connections between my thinking in that article and my hopes for the collaborative. And then we'll wrap up by looking ahead at some of our upcoming guests. Thanks for being here, and I look forward to our conversations. Hi, John. It's good to be here with you. Matt, good to be here with you. I'm excited. It's the first day out of the out of the gate. That's right. It's the first episode of this um, podcast, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, um, and so the other initiatives that it's uh, connected with. Mm-hmm. So let me start this way, John. I was happy when you told me that you were going to call the podcast uh, Studium, and mm. Uh, You know, I know that's Latin, and um, I'm kind of vaguely aware it has some connection with uh, Albertus Magnus College, which is where you and I teach. But could you, like, tell me more about about the, you know, the word itself and why you chose it? Um, And then maybe also uh, something about uh, who do you imagine the, the audience of this podcast being, tell you what, I'm going to bundle three questions. <laughs> I'd also that. like to know why you decided to do a podcast. Oh, good, good, good. Okay. All right, I, I'll, I'll take them in turn. We, we can do yeah. this. Well, um, yeah. I'm glad that you like the name Studium. I really like it, too. It's one of those Latin words that, that is a Latin word but doesn't feel, you know, unapproachably foreign. Um, we know it has something to do with study, uh, and, and it does. Um, it also has a connection with Albertus Magnus College in New Haven, Connecticut, where both of us teach. Um, Albert the Great, the namesake of our college, was the founder of the first ever studium, uh, mm. House of Studies, in Germany for the Dominican Order, the first ever house anywhere. Uh, he was invited to set it up so that students could not only have a place to, you know, go to school to get information, but where they could live together and study. Uh, so their their life and their study were joined in a way, and, and there was no question that what they were studying made a practical difference in their life. That's something I really like about it. Another thing I like about the word studium is that it's connected in Latin to the word for striving, to strive, right? And mm-hmm. We kind of forget that because we think about striving as having to do with business or, um, you know, athletics, and it does. But it also has to do with study. So what are you doing when you study? You're applying yourself, right? You're, you're intensively focusing on something. You're striving after something. Um, Albertus was a person himself who did this throughout his life. He's in 13th century, so we're back there in the Middle Ages. He was an early natural scientist. Uh, I mean, there was no such thing as the the natural sciences at that time. There was natural philosophy. Albertus, though, was a person who was a very keen observer of the world. Albertus went out into the field. He was was a bishop, too. He was known as Boots the Bishop. He would walk from place to place, and when he did, he would observe things, plants and animals, and he would write about them. He would describe them, right? Um, and I like that curiosity on his part. Um, a last word about Al- Albert. Uh, he was a teacher of Thomas Aquinas, uh, a very important figure in Christian history. And he saw potential in Thomas that a lot of other people missed. Now, I'm thinking of the second question. Who is the audience? Good question. I foresee I foresee, I hope, I wish I foresaw, right? (laughs) I'd like to foresee that the podcast will be a space where students, first of all, who are curious in these matters can find something of interest to them. It can also be a place for conversations among 
faculty colleagues. And by that, I don't just mean at Albertus Magnus College, of course. Faculty colleagues anywhere, teaching in the arts and humanities, who are always asked that question, what are the humanities good for? What are they good for? Why, why are you wasting your time on these, on these soft topics? We all know, right? This, this has even been more politically prominent lately than, than in the past. Okay, so how do we address that? Well, I, I think that kind of criticism of the humanities is just a mistake. It's, it's a misunderstanding of the humanities and the arts themselves. It's a misunderstanding of the kind of application that goes into them. So I wanna to talk to and bring together in a community people who are practitioners in these fields, people who are educators, people who are students or aspiring practitioners or educators, to really reflect on what are the arts and humanities good for? How are they transformative? And what difference do they make in our, in our lives? Now remind me of the third question, Matt, because that, that was a triple bundle and that's more yeah, yeah. than I can do. No, the third question was why, uh, you may have already spoken to this a little bit, but I, yeah. um, you know, why you just, why you chose to do a podcast at all? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, to me it feels like, and maybe it's a post COVID thing. It feels like a lot of us are listening to podcasts. One thing we're, we're on YouTube, media is changing. Um, and when we started this, this collaborative thing, so all the humanities and arts departments working together, you know, the standard thing to do three or four years ago would have been, well, let's get a, let's get a schedule of five visiting speakers and we'll have wine and cheese and we'll have a few Q and A's after the talk. And that's a beautiful thing. I've done that for years. It's a very enriching experience, but I think that's not where a lot of us are these days. Also, I think it's so important that we come together across space, right? So it's not just our colleagues at our institution, but we're having conversations with lots of people in lots of places doing lots of related things. And we're able to come together and kind of cross fertilize ideas that are gonna to lead to, to new avenues, new creative approaches to strengthening the teaching of the arts and humanities, which, which is so vital in my opinion today. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's a brilliant idea, John. And uh, one of the reasons is because, as you alluded to, um, in this format, uh, it's very yeah. easy to set up conversations with people, regardless of where they are. You know, we don't have to put them on a totally. plane and fly them and house. And they them. don't have to fly to us. Holy and they don't have to fly to us. It's, you know, you can you can do it. You can you can just you know, look at your calendars and set up a day and do it. And so it really opens a lot of doors for us to be able to have conversations. Yeah. Um, with different people. I also love that, I love your conviction about the, <clears throat> let's call it the relevance of arts and humanities. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's not just sort of a, a, a quirky dead end thing. Um, it's a thing that is um, extremely relevant, um, you know, to a lot of things that are going on in the world. And mm -hmm. I like that you want to highlight uh, that you referred to, in passing to the arts and humanities collaborative ah, yes, so yes. this is probably a good time for you to talk about because this studium is the podcast of the arts and humanities collaborative that's so right. what is what is what is this thing that you're talking about the arts and humanities collaborative why i mean it's new why was it created yeah. um you know let's talk about that for a little bit absolutely Alberta's Magnus College was founded in 1925 as the first four-year uh, residential college for women in New England. And this is, this is something our president, Mark Camille, often, often rightly emphasizes. It was an act of courage on the part of the sisters, the Dominican sisters who founded the college. They wanted to ensure that women at that time who were not able to be admitted into many institutions of higher education in the country had fully the same training in the liberal arts and in and, and humanities um, as, any, as anyone else did. Um, the humanities and arts have been central to our college's identity for a very long time. And since then, we've incorporated lots of other um, programs of study and, and training um, in, in other fields. And I want to, uh, I see the collaborative 
as an opportunity for us to think about the connections between those two. For departments of the art and humanities, there are five departments um, in our collaborative, um, to work together, to develop new programs, and that, that's a kind of internal thing, but also to, and I'm hoping we can do a bit of that here as well, you know, go out and engage with folks who are, maybe they have training in the humanities, but they're working in other fields, right? They're, they're involved in other conversations. I see the collaborative as a really unique approach to leaning in to the arts and humanities at a time when a lot of institutions are considering cutting arts and humanities, right? For our college, with our history and our identity, we can't afford that because it would make us be no longer who we are, right? Um, and I think that's true for lots of institutions. Um, so I, I think the collaborative model, I mean, we're not just joining them into a mega department. Right? We're preserving the distinctness of each of the five affiliated departments, but they're cooperating and they will have a sense of identity and their students will have a sense of belonging to a larger project, right? And, and that's something I'm very excited about. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, I know one of the conversations that, that led to the formation of the collaborative <laughs> was that one of the ways that the, the arts and humanities uh, remain relevant to what's going on in the world today mm -hmm. um, is through the development of, you know, new interdisciplinary uh, majors and minors. And so, to, you know, to bring the, um, the historical humanities and arts disciplines together and allow them to yep. collaborate means that we can have conversations about designing um, yep. new kinds of programs. Um, and it's, and it it's seems a very, like that's just one of the things that collaboration facilitates. Yeah, it, it's, it's an intentional step to, to make happen something that all of us want to happen. I mean, nobody wants to be siloed. We know this, right? And this is my department, that's your department. We know we have to collaborate, we want to collaborate. But there aren't the time and resources for that all the time. So this podcast and the collaborative is meant as a platform for that. And that's what I would like for it to be. Excellent. Well, you're going to be the host of this podcast. Um, and you'll be collaborating with others of us, occasionally me, but there'll be others Certainly. you're collaborating with, to, you know, to put on various episodes. And you'll be talking to all kinds of other people, asking them to talk about themselves. I think mm -hmm. it's a good idea in this first episode for uh, me to give you a chance to share a little bit about yourself, um, kind of in the context of, um, you know, what's your background that, that sort of made doing this kind of thing, both directing the mm -hmm. New Arts and Humanities Collaborative and yeah. this podcast. Tell us about your background and how it kind of prepares you for what you're doing now. Absolutely. Well, I, I've been so fortunate, Matt, to be able to spend a lot of years studying the arts and humanities, uh, especially the humanities, philosophy and religious studies are my, my two fields. Um, I started out at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York. Call out to Sarah Lawrence. Uh, great place to be. I, at Sarah Lawrence, never had a class of more than 15 or 20 students. It's a very, so I'll, I'll just, Sarah Lawrence, I'm going to give you a little free marketing, okay? It is a school where you walk in and you are in a small seminar also working one-on-one -on -one with your professor from the first day of your freshman year. So I always had a sense that education was about discussion in a small circle, as we were doing from day one, and also that it was about this kind of one-on-one -on -one work. It's called the tutorial system at, at Sarah Lawrence. So you, you have a, a, you know, a don, that they called it at that time, and, and you meet with that person, and you and him or her develop a, a research project. So that was very empowering, I think, at the age of 18. I, I remember we have a Meister Eckhart Center on campus. I remember I wrote a 30-page paper about Meister Eckhart's um, uh, table talk. Uh, my goodness, uh, you know, 
18 years old, that's not what I would have expected myself to be doing, but um, mm -hmm. I w had the opportunity to do it. From there, I went on to McGill University and then the Catholic University of Leuven to do degrees in religious studies and in philosophy. And in both of those master's programs, I was so blessed and, and grateful to be a part of a learning community. And I think that was a really big thing for me because Sarah Lawrence was often very individual, right? So at McGill and in Leuven, there was a, a tight-knit group of students who lived and breathed this stuff, right? And we, we would go out and talk about Hegel, and we would walk down the street and talk about Schopenhauer. Like it, was, it was just what we did in Leuven, right? Um, and that was really formative. And, and the last place I spent a time as a student was at uh, Brown University in Providence in, in their Religion and Critical Thought program in the Religious Studies Department. Hi, Tal, Mark, and Steve. Um, that was a wonderful time, a really formative time. And it helped me to understand, I think, I mean, certainly how the academy works, right? I mean, the, the, the realities of, I'm not just a bachelor's or a master's student now, I'm a PhD student, you, know, you kind of see how the sausage is made in a way. Um, but also, um, the emphasis that Brown has, and it's such a, a really enriching part of their mission on public engagement, on, on, on the, the role of the public intellectual, someone who's Who's, who's involved in public conversations, right? So yes, doing scholarly work, but also reaching out always and, and working with others to achieve better the common good. And I think that was a, a really influential piece of that, of that time for me and, and something I really admire about Brown. Um, from there I went on, I, I taught for a year at Fordham University in, uh, in the Bronx. I taught for two years as a, a part-time faculty at Fairfield University. Uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut, um, and then I, I joined the faculty at Albertus Magnus College. Um, and uh, in all of those places, Matt, I mean, I, I feel like a cliche. I'm just living the questions. I'm just living the questions. Because that, that's what I'm doing with my students all the time. I'm like, let, let's talk about formulating the question. Let's engage about the question. Let's unpack the question, right? And, and I am convinced, after a couple decades of doing this stuff, that that is a rigorous practice, right? Can it not be a rigorous practice? Sure, but so can business and sports, right? I mean, this is just as rigorous as anything else that we could be doing uh, with our time. Yeah, good. I, I mean, I can see how that, you know, the, the, the background that you have uh, is so steeped in liberal arts and humanities, yeah. but also um, in a kind of cross-disciplinary um, away, and I also see this thread of learning communities, really kind of learning in community. Yeah. Um, and I and I know that one of the goals you have, I mean, both as a teacher and uh, for this podcast, is to sort of create a sense of you know long form conversation, really, really getting to unpack yeah. questions, getting to know people. Um, so it all feels very um, coherent. Since we're on the subject of you, but also because I think it's it's directly relevant to um, your work with the collaborative and with this podcast, mm -hmm. I wanted to um, just have a short conversation with you about an article that you recently published yeah. uh, in the Journal of Catholic Higher Education, mm -hmm. and is an article on Jacques Maritain, a personalist uh, philosopher, and personalism. You know, I've come to learn is one of those things that um, kind of has tentacles in a lot of places. It does. And yet, you know, there are very few people who are like really, really familiar um, with it. And mm -hmm. you were especially interested, you know, Mariton um, wrote about personalist pedagogy. Let's yes. talk about uh, yes. your article and, and, and what personalist pedagogy is first. And then we'll talk about how you see that related to the collaborative. Absolutely. Yeah, Jacques Maritain was a, was a person who um, was a really well-known figure during his time. He's, he's known in uh, France for, for writing very beautifully in French, and, and that translates well as well. He, he writes really rich works. He devoted himself to a lot of different subjects, and in that article I focus on his two kind of sustained engagements with education. Uh, so that's in 1943, 
which is a remarkable year to pause to think about education in the middle of the Second World War. And then I think 1962 or the, the early 1960s, um, when he again um, published on the subject um, it, independently of that first engagement. Um, so that, that's what I'm looking at there. Mm -hmm. What I really like about Maritain, he articulates in this crystal clear way what are, as he puts it, the two essential aims of education. The two essential aims. Now, he's, he's a scholastic philosopher. He's a Thomist, right? He studies Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so he, when he says essential, that means something. He's not just saying important. He's saying these things are of the essence of education. If you don't have either one of them, you don't have education. Right? The first thing, that you are helping the student to achieve integrity as a person. You're helping the student to achieve integrity. That is, for all of the parts of a student to fit together in some way, to make sense. It doesn't have to be a you know, Procrustean kind of forcing things together, but that the student is able to see connections between different parts of her education, her education, her work, her work and her family life. And she can kind of feel how all of those things fit together, number one. And number two, to train the student to contribute to society and be successful in her vocation. Now, I, I feel like today, education often means only the second of those. And the first of those is seen as a luxury that we can't afford. College is expensive, economy is competitive, we don't have time for this kind of self-indulgence. I want to say it's not self-indulgence. I mean, if education means to, to educe, right? To, you can reduce, you can adduce, or you can educe, right? So in education, you're educing, you're drawing out something. What are you drawing out, right? You're drawing out the identity, the potential, the, the self-expression, all of the possible glorious variations of each individual student that you work with. Here, Mary Tan says there's a, there's a mystery about that. We don't, we don't know, we have students in front of us, right? As educators and students, having been a student myself once for a very long time, um, we don't know either. That, that's part of what you're discovering. You're discovering what your potential is. It's not like you know, you know, my potential is to earn 100,000, you know? No, it's not like, what, what, a, what a thin, what a thin life, right? Who are you as a person is the question from Maritain. And, uh, and he approaches that in a few ways I'd, I'd love to talk about, but that, that's what I see as his big contribution is, is identifying those as essentially connected. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, you know, it's true. Obviously, um, you know, there's a push towards education being um, almost purely applicable to um, job and vocation and I mean there are sound economic reasons for that push because college is um, expensive and it seems like the um, the alternative to that is not to um, extricate uh, humanities but mm. to you know to, to use the language that you used earlier when you were talking about the collaborative mm -hmm. um, is to really sort of insist that you know we will have better entrepreneurs and business people and scientists and engineers if they mm -hmm. are people who in uh you know the preparation of the liberal arts education um, mm -hmm. have been shaped in ways that uh, make them you know responsible and have a kind of enlarged view of the world mm -hmm. and are really capable of conversing with others mm -hmm. um you know I, I yeah. was always very interested in this report by the AACNU, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, um, where they interview executives and hiring managers. And, um, you know, by far the dominant um, perspective was that they rank extremely highly students who mm -hmm. have the broad liberal arts education, including arts mm -hmm. and humanities, mm -hmm. because they know that those students come in um you know n not just with a technical skill but with an ability yeah. to uh, sort of think broadly and widely and communicate um 
So, I mean, that's very interesting about uh, Maritana. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, one of those lectures he gave was in 43. Maybe yeah. we could revisit that quickly. I think that was here in New Haven at, at Yale for the Terry lectures. If it I was. If it I'm was. right about that. Yeah. And um, that seems significant because it's in the middle of World War II. He's invited for these very prestigious lectures. He chooses mm-hmm. to write about pedagogy. Yeah. Uh, you know, one one could think, well, are there more important things going on in the world? Yeah. Um, what's your take on why he would? What, what's significant about him choosing to to lecture on um, per, on pedagogy? Yeah. Smack in the middle of World War II. I guess I'd say there's there's a distinction between what should we do, and on the one hand, and who are we and why are we doing it on, on the other? The, the different kinds of questions, right? Maritan really, to my reading, on my reading, focused in on the latter of those questions, right? As we conclude this war with confidence that it will conclude in the favor of, of, of the Allies, um, he was living in the United States at the time, from France, of course, but had stayed here during the war. As this war concludes, what are we to do and who are we to be? What is this post-war world going to look like? What is going to ensure that the monstrosity of the Second World War, the the terrible events that, that, that occurred at that time, do not occur again? Well, that can be best ensured if It's not just a matter of building new systems and structures. Yes, you need to have those too, but you need to ask who is inhabiting those? You know, who will the people of the post-war world be? And I think that's what led him to focus on education. In a way, it was a a very practical approach, um, but but a very deep dive into uh, 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 looking forward to what would come, what would come later. I mean, it seems, you know, you also alluded to the fact that, uh, you know, the trend in higher ed for the past few decades has been to cut back on arts and humanities education. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, and then here we are, you know, in the 21st century, and we're seeing sort of the fragility of democracy. And it mm. seems like that makes... Uh, you know, Maritain's decision to focus on pedagogy in the middle of World War II, mm-hmm. um, newly significant. It also seems like it, it really affirms the, you know, choices of, of schools. We're not the only ones, but schools like Albertus Magnus College to kind of go all in on arts and humanities. Yeah. Um, because, you know, not only uh, do I think it makes, you know, better persons and, and people you know, better at their vocations, but also better citizens. Absolutely. And, and that's something that was really distinctive um, about Maritain's view. He insisted that especially in a democratic society, we, we claim that the demos, the people, are sovereign. Who is our head of state? Not the president, right? The, pre- the president is the head of one of the branches of government. The head of state is the people. Wow, that, that's complicated, right? Well, who, who are the people? Do the people know that they're the people? Do, do, do the people know how to be citizens? Can, can they speak and act in public in ways that are effective and collaborative and, and cooperative um, with, with their neighbors? I mean, if the answer is no, that society will not, will not continue. As, as a democracy. So just practically speaking, Maritain felt that in every school, f- f- from, from the, the most kind of vocational uh, training programs to the most you know, ethereal programs in, in classics and philosophy, the liberal arts must be taught if we're serious about what we say our values are. Our values are. Let me just say a word about the word liberal here in liberal education as well. I feel like we kind of kind of miss that um, often. 
uh, you know, the, the word liberal, we are accustomed to hearing that contrasted with conservative, right? liberal or conservative, okay, the, the, the libs, I've heard it said, right, okay. Uh, that's not what it means here. Um, the, the, the word liberal here means uh, to, to liberate, to, to be free, right? If I sit down at a piano, Matt, I always wanted to learn to play the piano, and I didn't. I, I can't play the piano. I, I can play two ditties that I, that I learned when I was like 12 or something, right? But when I sit down at the piano, I feel in myself a desire to play that piano. And I am not free to do it because I have not been formed in that particular skill. I, I, I have not had that capacity educed from me, right? Uneducated. That's frustrating. When I'm, when I'm speaking to someone and I feel like I know what I want to say in that weird way that we say, you know, I know what I want to say, but I can't actually find the words for it, I am not free because I cannot express what I want to do in that moment. Um, that's not some kind of soft problem, right? That's a very practical problem. If people are unable to engage effectively in that way, so the, the liberal arts, I mean, traditionally, you know, grammar, logic, and rhetoric um, being the, the trivium, the, the first of the three liberal arts, um, these are not just uh, trivial, right? Th these are the skills that enable us to do effectively and meaningfully everything we go on to do afterwards. So I feel like the, the liberal arts are the arts that liberate. The liberal arts are the arts that liberate us from the unfreedom of being unable to do what we want to do, right? To, fe to feeling that we're that we're uh, we're ineffective, right? We're 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 weak. We we can't we can't do it. Um, so so this is one reason why I feel like arts and humanities are are so important and how they're they're so essentially bound up, as Maritan says, with training in other fields. Because this is, this is what enables progress for students who are developing expertise in those other fields. They're able to really show up in public and be effective and work with others and think creatively because of these much maligned liberal arts right, that have set them free to do so. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you, um, you know, dove into the sort of the history of that term. Um, it, 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 it is worth uh, reclaiming it, and it's worth clarifying it. Yes. Um, the, I don't imagine that when you wrote the essay on Maritain and personalist pedagogy that you were imagining it as some sort of manifesto for an arts and humanities <laughs> collaborative. Mm -hmm. But, no. um, you know, before I move on to, to ask you my next question, um, do you see connections between what you did in that essay and the kind of work that you that the collaborative will be doing? I do, I do. Um, the word personalist in, in that term, personalist pedagogy, as you uh, suggested earlier, it's a word with many meanings. Uh, I, I wrote my dissertation on personalism and I don't know if we ever really determined, is, is it a philosophy, a tradition, a movement, a trend? You know, <laughs> simply a word. I mean, it's all of these things. Uh, J Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was trained uh, in a group in those Boston personalists, the Boston personalists at Boston University in the 1950s, uh, 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. Um, and it's had a really extensive reach. Uh, Maritain also used it in France I independently. Um, uh, you know, what I like We've about We've also talked it, about how it, how it shows up in France Finance work. Martin yes, specifically, yeah. Or I think Mounier, the other, another one of Emmanuel the Emmanuel Mounier, with, with whom Mounier. I spent the most time, indeed, in, in yeah. when I was working on that dissertation. Um, yeah. You know, the, the great, the great kind of driving conviction of, of that personalist movement was that both, I mean, at the time, both the United States and the Soviet Union both of these mass societies, these, these large kind of, you know, um, extensive societies, uh, were failing to 
acknowledge that every human being is a person, is an individual, but is also part of a community, part of a, I don't know, you say collective, right? that has more of a mechanical connotation, but that we are not just isolated atoms, right? Merely individuals but we're also not just cogs in the machine, as the phrase goes, right? And, and so they were trying to, to find a way between the two. As we set forth on this collaborative, I think the idea of a collaborative is really interesting because as I said before, it preserves the distinctness and emphasizes the distinctness of our individual departments. It doesn't collapse those departments into a single department. It doesn't say just, you know, oh, we're all doing the same thing. We're not doing the same thing and we're not the same person, and we don't have the same concerns. That diversity is our strength, right? Um, and so I think the, the collaborative, as Maritain and the personalists sought to do, is trying to bring people together to facilitate and, and kind of, you know, uh, uh, pr promote cross-pollination, you know, in, within our community, um, but also to preserve the distinctiveness and the uniqueness of each department of each student, each member of faculty, all, all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, I do see that as an important connection. Mm. That's interesting. <clears throat> um, you, you know, the way you're sort of making that connection between, between the way the personalist thought of the person mm -hmm. and in the collaborative sort of the, the yeah. independence and yet also togetherness of the disciplines. Yeah. Um, it's a loose federal structure. It's a very loose federal structure. But you, but, but drawing <laughs> right. on Martin's language, you have a, a, a much more uh, poetic way of talking about this. I mean, the title of your paper is called Scattering the Stars. Scattering Tell us what that the means. Stars. What, what, oh, what is that yeah. about? Oh, yeah. Well, Mar Maritain was a, was a Roman Catholic, a Christian philosopher. He, he, he always insisted he was, he was a Christian philosopher and, and spent a lot of time working out exactly what that means, you know. Um, maybe topic for another time. I'd love to, to talk more with you about that, Matt. But that title, Scattering the Stars, is Maritain's contrast with another image uh, he provides in that text, a fortress on the land. In both cases, he's talking about the community of people called the church, right? He's writing as Roman Catholic in that moment. What, what's the difference between those two? On the one hand, the fortress on the land, right? You're, you're, you're stuck down on, on the earth, right? And you're defensive, and you're all kind of in this walled enclosure, right? You're, you're keeping people out, you're preserving things as they are. Alternatively, you have in the sky, right, a constellation. You have each star with its own source of fuel, with its own lifespan, with its own size and characteristics, right? And somehow, for those with eyes to see, let's say, right, for those with eyes to see, you're able to recognize that those stars form patterns, right, in a certain way, constellations, right? And so this network, this invisible network of individuals, yes, but they're bound together in a kind of community. That's Maritain's, I would say, okay, I said it's his model for the church. I think it's also his model for that post-World War II society that we were talking about earlier, right? That, that there wouldn't be, you know, a, an overarching central committee. Uh, there also wouldn't be, you know, a, a blind market in which everybody has to fight it out like it's, you know, Shark Tank. Uh, but, but that there would be this sense of solidarity across individuals in the post-war world. And we see that realized through projects like the founding of the United Nations, which Maritain was involved in. And he was a contributor to the drafting of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that was put out in 1948. So I, I think in that model of the United Nations, you know, unity in distinctness, uh, we're going to preserve, like, you know, France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy. Oh, Switzerland's not in it. Uh, but in addition, you know, we will come together and we'll be, what was that phrase I once heard? Stronger together. Yes? Stronger yeah. together. I heard that once. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. seem to recall that, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Well, the the, um, the collaborator is going to have you know more success than that phrase did, unfortunately, at that time. Um, I, I like this image of the constellation. John, can you tell us, give us a sense of um, what? I mean, do you have any anything lined up so far in terms of upcoming podcasts? Tell us about. It. Give us give us a teaser. Oh, oh, we do, we do. I'm, oh, I'm very excited. Um, so I, I think our next episode is going to be a monthly podcast. Um, I, we've, um, we've um, secured the the generous agreement of one of the leaders at the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, who will be uh, coming on the podcast together with one of our students um, who just did an internship over the summer at the Barnum Museum. So we're going to talk with them about well, what I want to learn about is, you know, uh, curatorial work, about museums, about how they're reaching out to the public, how they're using the skills and, and uh, dispositions they developed uh, as students of the humanities and the arts uh, in their work. Um, that's going to be a really interesting conversation. I want to learn about uh, uh, Barnum, Barnum as well, uh, who is, of course, the the circus, uh, the, the circus performer. He was he a performer, Barnum? I, I don't think he was a performer. I think he. Yeah, I don't know. He ran the show. I uh, guess well, we will find out. I'll ask. I'll ask her next week. Um, also, um, we've had the generous agreement of um, the Alder. Uh, for uh, Ward 20, um, the Newhallville Ward, right here where we are in, in New Haven. Um, Devin uh, Afshalom Smith, uh, who will be, uh, who has studied uh, philosophy in college, that was, that was his major, uh, and he'll be coming on to talk about how his study of philosophy informs his work now as the alder for a really important ward um, in uh, the city of New Haven, and, and how it kind of informs uh, his his day to day uh, in in that in that setting, um, and the third one that we have um, set up for sure is well, well I think I think we've already done something with this. Um, it uh, Ross, um, what what is Ross's last name, Matt? Ross Kenyon. Ross yes. Kenyon, right? And, yeah, yeah. and so I know you were able to have a conversation recently with Ross. I think I think we're going to kind of translate some of that, you know, for for our audience, so we can we can follow um, follow the mm -hmm. important work that that Ross is doing but that'll be an opportunity to think through so we, we've looked at kind of museums and we've looked at political um, life um, but we also want to think about tech right and technology yeah. and innovation and um, uh, environmental uh, sustainability issues and and, yes. and things like that so, oh, so we should really just add their conversation that, about that ross I, I my conversation with ross kenyon is in his capacity as a, a co-founder and the creative editor of a company called Nori, which is a, mm. a carbon marketplace that works uh, currently specifically within the regenerative agriculture movement. And Ross also has a, a background in history and philosophy and political philosophy. And um, he hosts the Reverse and Climate Change podcast. Um, so um, that, that will be a fun conversation for us to present in the context of this um, podcast. To me, it's perfect bringing together arts, humanities, and science and technology and ecology. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to that. There's another Absolutely. episode that I look forward to, John. It's, it's one where, with a few months' practice, you come back and play some piano sonatas. Ah. You liberate yourself, John. Well, uh, what I'll Let's need is Let's put that on a, the uh, schedule spring uh, next year. Why don't you ask our administration to give me a generous stipend so I can have some time to, to uh, practice that piano. You need, but we'll, uh, you need a course release for that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll follow up. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back on that, Matt. Matt, thank you so much for, for our conversation. Oh, John, it was an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you uh, letting me interview mm -hmm. you, um, who, you know, will will host most of these episodes coming up just so we could get to learn about Absolutely. you and sort of your vision for the podcast and the collaborative. And, uh, I look forward to it. I can't Me wait. Me too, man. Me too. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks a lot.